All right. Okay, big crowd. Excellent. All right. So, look at the title of this thing. You can tell that I was in marketing for a while. Game changer. That was supposed to be a hook that would get like three or four hundred people in here. Didn't work. That's, I'm not in marketing anymore. <laughs> I'm, about, I'm back to doing real work, okay? I work for a living now. So, so no offense to any of you marketing folks or anything like that. Okay, see here we go, some more people who don't know anything about this stuff. Yeah, it's just, you know, have a whole room of all your buddies. Um, anyway, for the two or three of you who don't know me, I'm Rob Tiffany. <laughs> oh, it's the Wolf Vision. Excellent. Those are always nice to have. All right, um, so anyway, I'm Rob. Let's see here if we can make this thing work. There we go. There's the I am Rob page. Excellent. All right. So we can... Anyway, uh, so I'm a mobility architect. So what do I do now is I'm a professional airline passenger, and I fly all over the place and help our biggest customers, you know, help with Windows Mobile and deploy it and build solutions and design solutions uh, and get them off all those other evil platforms and onto ours and stuff like that. I don't drink the Kool-Aid very much. Um, I, I built the first accelerator, and I helped architect the second accelerator. It's a tool, uh, you know, a little application you can download from our download site. That's a little supply chain management app. It's just an example app uh, to kind of help beginners get started, you know, who have never done any development or anything like that. And you know, I added to my little other stuff here, and see, and we talked earlier. I need two laser pointers because these things are so far away. I added this jockey to the end of what I used to be. You know, I used to have the submarine thing and all the other stuff, but we added disc jockey because I hadn't done that. Okay. Huh? Oh, excellent. We've got lasers everywhere. All I need is sharks with laser beams. Excellent. Good. So, anyway, we're going to talk about um, getting a. a well, I, I, there's an unfair audience here. How many people know about how all the, uh, like, memory, deal, the whole memory limitations of. Windows Mobile running on CE5. Yes, you, sir, over there. Who's, yes. What can you tell me about them? I know that uh, Windows Mobile uh, uh, comes from the Windows CE, and uh, there is a problem, and then it's still not uh, memory. The block memory. Sure. Sometimes you hear people talk about 32 and 32 sometimes. You know, you get 32, you can run 32 apps, and each app only gets 32 mega RAM. Actually, that's not even true. You don't even get that much. So that's not good. So people, a lot of people come into Windows Mobile from the desktop all the time, and they program like they're programming on the desktop, and they wonder what the problem is with their giant bloated apps and stuff like that and why they don't work right. Um, and it's because we have these limitations of these uh, little, they're called slots, actually. Uh, and um, it, it's nothing like Vista or Windows 7 or server or even we have a new uh, version of our embedded operating system. It's actually not new at all. It's like two years old, CE6, which uh, took care of all these weird slot issues. And it can do 32,000 processes, and each process gets two gig of RAM. So that sounds a lot more like the desktop while still being embedded in a real-time operating system. But back in Windows Mobile land, where we are today, and I'm just going to kind of focus on 6 and 6.1 and 6.5, we're sitting on top of CE5, and it has these, the slots kind of deal going on here. So it's a 32-bit operating system, so you get the whole 4 gig of virtual memory. Does everybody know what virtual memory is versus physical memory? Can you explain that, Mr. Bowling? Because it seems like you got memory and memory and some other memory, and commit, committed and reserved, and what's the deal with that? I do. Here, you know what? I've got, so we have some distinguished guests here. And um, they knew about this in advance. It's not like I'm making this up as I go along, but yeah, I am. Why, anyway, thank you, Rob. Yes, this guy knows, this is Doug Bowling, of Doug Bowling Consulting and, uh, and Training, and he knows more about this platform than anybody. And he goes to Microsoft to train the people at Microsoft. Uh, oh, well. Well. Well, I do. But you do, I mean, okay. okay. So. Um, so the difference, physical memory versus virtual memory. Of course, physical memory is what you put in the machine, and so that's actually physically addressed. But we all know that applications, we don't want applications to think of memory as physical memory. Why? I'm going to ask somebody else a question. 
Why don't you want applications thinking about physical memory? Fragmentation is one, might be one issue. Paging. Paging, we want to be able to bring stuff in and out independent of what the application knows about, although we never take things out in CE. But there's another big reason. Isolate the memory from each other so that each application thinks it's got its own memory and not stomping on other. There's one other very big reason. Shared modules. Shared modules. Boy, you guys are coming up with some good reasons. But actually, what about the fact that we don't want the applications? I mean, to put, put this in perspective, why was Windows created? Bill Gates had a couple reasons for creating Windows. One of the big ones was to get the apps off the hardware. In other words, no hardware dependencies in the applications. One of the ways you do that is virtual memory and virtual spaces. So if you make the applications, if the applications are designed to run on a virtual memory space, a made up memory space, what the physical hardware looks like is irrelevant. Now on the PCs, it's always the same hardware. But in Windows Mobile and Windows CE, the physical hardware is always completely different. Depending on, you know, it depends on whatever the chip is, whatever the CPU is, Windows Mobile is always ARM. So in our case, the virtual memory allows the, the application isolation. We have no, and it has no clue as to what the physical memory looks like. It's only operating in some kind of virtual memory sandbox. Is that That's enough? Perfect. Thank you, sir. You probably want a phone for that or something, don't you? That's why I'm going to go back to the well a few times on all you folks. All right. Yes, I, do. <laughs> I had a feeling you probably have them all. All right. So anyway, let's talk about why we're here, okay? I'm going to talk to you about how 6.5, you have more. He described for you what virtual memory is versus physical memory. And that's what the, a lot of this talk is about, is virtual memory. I'm going to tell you a story that starts at 6 and goes to 6.1 and ends at 6.5, where we are gaining more and more virtual memory, um, which is a good thing. Better for the device, better for stability, more headroom, all that good stuff. I'm also going to talk to you about how 6.5 boosts performance in the UI and applications, uh, which is great. You've maybe been to the booth. You've seen how 6.5 looks. You think that 6.5 and moving to it is about a new home screen and cool new UI and a great browser, and it is. But I want you to know that it's more than skin deep. There is something really happening under the covers, and I wanted to share that with you guys because uh, it's the real deal. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is a kind of a different way of doing a .NET compact framework development, a real simple switch you can do. In your, in your development that will give you more memory for your application than you have today. Um, so I think taking all that together, you're probably excited. You know, we have the new marketplace opening up, and so we're all going to finally build apps for the mobile device. OK, we've been doing that all decade and putting them on Handango and stuff like that. But now we have to have a device app store on the device. So we're going to do that. And so for those of you, some people write apps that are small and tiny and don't need to worry about what I'm about to talk about. But then there are a few handful of people that are going to build memory-intensive giant applications that they run their large enterprises on. They're going to build resource-intensive games that use lots of memory and resources. And those who I'm talking to now. And so you may not be there today, but you might be there someday. All this stuff will benefit you. This new pattern I'm going to tell you about, you, can, you should start using it for everything. It doesn't supersede another pattern you might, an MVC or some other pattern. You, you can use it in conjunction with whatever you're doing. So let's move along and dive into it. I can't do a, a Doug Bowling or a Mike Zentel impersonation or any of that stuff as I show slots here. So I'm just going to do my best. So 32-bit operating system, 4 gig, right? Virtual memory you know, space that we're looking at. Top two, go for the kernel. Bottom two, you got those slots we were talking about. And then this other big, large memory area, this kind of playland, the fun stuff. But it's also scary because everybody can see each other. So the big takeaway here is when so we look at this lot. So since I'm not sitting in the back of the room, I don't have my two lasers. But I'm going to start from the bottom to the top here on this presentation here. So slot 0. Slot 0 is where the application is currently executing. And I was always confused by that because I go, well, I've got all these other slots. And I've got applications all running at the same time. Unlike the iPhone, where I only get one at a time, I'm running lots of apps all the time and doing really work. You know. Don't you love it when you go to the Apple Store to buy something there, and when it comes to checkout time, they pull out a Windows Mobile device to swipe your card? I love that. I love that. We got all kinds of things running in the background and threads and everything. But I was always confused about slot zero. Um, 
Because I'd be like, well, I got all these things. How can they all be in slot zero at the same time? Well, well, they're really not. But you can imagine um, to the, the CPU and everything, it seems as if they are. And so you might have a, an application in slot 13, let's say, running along. And maybe it needs to do a file copy operation. And so it wants to do, it's a .NET application, and it wants to do a file copy. Well, guess what? It's going to end up calling filesys.exe. And so it's going to be pulled out of slot zero, your app, and we're going to put filesys.exe into slot zero, and it's going to do your file operation. Then it's going to back itself out and put your app back in there. Sounds kind of like a, the old wooden Turing machines or whatever. That might have gone over your head. Anyway, um, anyway, so that's kind of how it works, generally speaking. Um, so slot zero is key. Even though we've got things running, apps running in all these slots, in slots two through 32, all your apps are running there. They all find their way into slot zero. So it's important for that slot to have as much memory available as possible so that your apps have lots of headroom, so that things don't happen that cause instability in your device. Well, but we have a problem here. In slot one, we have these ROM DLLs. We have file DLLs and module DLLs. Well, I think of all that stuff's kind of obscure. Everybody thinks, well, a DLL's a DLL. And I want you to keep in mind, as I talk through the first bit of these slides, this is mostly targeted to OEMs who are building devices. You get to benefit as a side effect of the changes we've made in memory, but you know, I don't want you to get too worried about some of the minutia in here, because it, it, this is designed for OEMs, so people who are actually building devices you know, with Platform Builder. So you have file DLLs, they're like read-only DLLs. You have module DLLs, they're executable, they actually do things. Um, there's also another difference. Some just kind of get loaded into memory on the fly, and some of them are, are kind of pinned up, like at, at build time, where they're going to live is defined in advance. And that's an important distinction as far as loading speed, where they go, that kind of thing. So anyway, one problem you can see, you know, I kind of, at the top here, I talk about a slot fill order. I'm going to have a slot fill order with every version of Windows Mobile 6. These file DLLs are starting right out of the gate in slot zero. And so you're already up against it with these DLLs. Um, module DLLs start in one, and then they can overflow into slot zero. So um, that's kind of the state of the art, and that's kind of your, your typical CE5 system. Uh, again, you have the slots 2 through 32 is where your app's running. There's the large memory area in slots 33 through 61, and that's where memory map files can go. And again, you can put memory map files, but anybody else who can find that memory address can see them. So don't think of that in a very secure way. Um, but NetCF actually does that. Uh, slot, and it, you know, resource DLLs up at the top at slot 63, that's just a, a DLL with resources. It doesn't have an entry point into it. Uh, and then the shared heaps in 62, it's kind of a misnomer. It's a, they're not really shared. They're heaps that each person can have, each app could have privately, but it's another place for them. Um, the one thing, has, has anyone ever heard about the whole notion in the past uh, about making sure your DLLs are bigger than 64K? Because if they're smaller, you're wasting space. Mr. Bowling. Yes, you have. Yes, you probably told everybody originally. Uh, and I've told everyone else. And everyone else has told everyone else. So a while back, I, like I remember when we were building stuff, you know, let's just go back to, not too far back, just Windows Mobile 5. And so that was kind of the rule of thumb, is if you had a whole bunch, I've been at customers that literally had over 100 little tiny DLLs, and they were wasting so much space, because one 5K DLL is still gonna waste 64K, right? So that's not so good. Okay, well something happened at the Windows Mobile 6 time frame, when we did a little bit of changing to the CE5 kernel. So a good friend of mine who's done the haul for me, his name is Mike Hall, he told me the story, I forgot the name of the guy on the team, who just said, you know, it's kind of ridiculous that we still have the 64K thing. That's a throwback for CE supporting all these different chips. But Windows Mobile only supports ARM, so why do we keep having one hand tied behind our back? Let's just blow that off and let's take care of that. And that's where we got to this 4K alignment for module DLLs starting with CE6 because someone thought outside the box momentarily and realized that we're only on ARM for these and so we don't have to worry about that 64K thing. So that's a good thing. So anyway, that's kind of the state of the art a few years ago. So let's move forward to where to 6.1 where we had huge changes. But before we go, let's see a demo. All right, I've got my little HTC Advantage here. 
I didn't know if I was going to have wolf vision in time, so I'm just doing the VGA output on the advantage. I'm going to show you a cool little app. Uh, what's the name of the guy? Some guy you know, on the code project, who's one of our sponsors for this, such, uh, for this event, wrote this app. It, it's a, a virtual memory visualization kind of thing. Let's see, I think I already have it. Might be running. Yeah, here we go. All right, pretty cool stuff. You can download this from Code Project. This kind of gives you a visualization, and let me go all the way to the bottom here, a graphic, you know, of what I was trying to describe to you, you know, in text or whatever, is all these different slots. So right now I've highlighted slot one. And remember, that's where I told you all those, those DLLs for the operating system. They're all hanging out. So when you look across the whole big thing there, most of it's red. That's just free memory, free virtual memory. The key thing to take away is the blue stuff is all being used. Now there we got reserved memory and committed memory. Glenn, do you know what the difference between those are? There you go. That's Glenn Jones, by the way, and he hangs out at Pepsi, and we're friends with Anna, and we've worked for years together. Um, and uh, anyway, so let's. Uh, so you can see we've, we've got a lot of we've got a lot of clogging up going here in slot one, and then slot two, file sys. I mentioned that earlier. Anything you want to do file out of that's living there. Um, services. Think of NT services. You got an exe where a bunch of DLLs bind to it. Uh, and that's where they run. It was kind of a thing we put in. When, when did we put that in? CE5? You know, where we could, people had, a, you know, it's just kind of like a, the device DXE, a place for a thing to bind. And, and device DXE is an interesting one here. And you can see it's using a bunch of stuff. Uh, that's for all the device drivers. It, that DXE loads all the DLLs for all the device drivers. And as you can imagine, that's been a, so a sore spot for us around stability because our phones are doing more and more things. And we're loading more and more device drivers, like cameras and accelerometers and GPS and all that kind of stuff. So we start getting crunched there. Moving right along, GUIs, that's uh, a graphics windowing event system. Shell 32. I have no idea what SAP settings. I'm not running SAP on this device. File Explorer is running. Connection Manager, the app I'm running, and you see some empty slots. Anyway, Pocket Outlook. So. Anyway, this has to be a sense. Now, I have another friend, Reed, back here in the back. And I think he has something he wants to say about this blue stuff at the top. Reed, do you have any idea what those blue things are at the top, kind of heading downward? Uh, those are very light. Do you need a microphone? I think there's a mic right there. <laughs> you're a real outgoing guy, and I really want you to get out here. Just pretend you're on Oprah, OK? This particular app before. I apologize. But, uh, I just put him on the spot. So he knows about DLLs coming down from the top and EXEs coming up from the bottom. Bottom. So which is top and bottom? This is the crunch that we're going to talk That's about that gets you into trouble. That's the crunch yep. we're talking about. So your EXEs, when they launch and everything they do, are coming from the bottom up in the slot, and then these DLLs are pushing downward from the top down. And that's where thing gets interesting with the with the DLLs, right? I just know you've written a lot of them about. Yeah, so I, I could go off on, I don't want to spoil your story, but, but essentially, <laughs> but essentially your, your DLLs become what you really, really want to track with these applications. And there's a reason why, and this is why we get into slot one and slot zero and the overflow and how the crunch starts. So I'll pull, feel free to pull me back in. I don't want to I'll pull you waste back your story. in later. But, you know, he's a DLL crunch kind of guy, and so I need to give him some love. So let's move along. All right. So 6.1, huge changes, you can tell by the screen. All right, we, you can see there's a whole lot more slots that you're seeing now than you had before. So what did we add? We added slot 59. Remember I talked about device DXE, all the device drivers being loaded in there, getting crowded, using up memory, and maybe running out of memory, that kind of thing with new device drivers, things getting plugged in. So we gave another slot. Uh, for all those little stacks of threads to go to, to give you a little more headroom. Uh, and what was that called? The little hammer? The, yeah, I thought, yeah, device, the 59, I thought was a little hammer. 
But then the other key thing is we have added, so you can see, slot 60 and 61. Now we have another place to put those pesky file DLLs that were originally only living in slot 0 and, and eating up our memory, right? So now you can see that slot fill order, they're going to 60 and 61 first before they start crowding us out in, in 0. So this is huge stuff. Anybody who's still on you know, Windows Mobile 5 or even 6 and is thinking about 6.1, when people think about 6.1, they think about Mobile Device Manager. But I'm here to tell you there's a whole lot more to 6.1 than Mobile Device Manager, and I hope I can illustrate that for you right now. So more room for those. So if you see here at the bottom, I kind of, in this little blue thing, you know, we, we have recommendations to the OEMs when they're building devices. So you can tell MSHTML DLL, that's obviously the web browser. Um, telling our OEMs to convert that to a file DLL when they build things, you know, they have the sections in uh, Platform Builder. Obviously, Whammo saved you six meg of, of VM. So b by the fact that we can put all these file DLLs in slot 60 and 61, you could save up to 64 meg of VM. You know, I'm not going to say you're saving at all, and, and it varies at, by OEM, but a huge saving. So there's a lot of great stuff there. The other thing here, in the little yellow deal, uh, DLLs. So we talked about this DLL crunch, and they're going down. And so basically, the, the, the takeaway is a native DLL if I use a native DLL and I load it up, it's not just coming down on my slot and penalizing me, it's penalizing all my neighbors in their respective slots. So I'm not a good neighbor doing that. Uh, but that's just the way it is because the OS thinks, well, those other guys may want to share it too and that kind of thing. Um, so what we did also in 6.1 is, this, I don't want to call it a registry, but there's a little app that right when you know, you're building things that basically kind of, you can mark certain DLLs. If you have a DLL that's only ever going to work with one EXE somewhere in the operating system, you can mark it as such, and it will no longer count against everybody else. And an example of that in 6.1 has to, you know how we have uh, SQL Server Compact in ROM? Well, SQL Server Compact, as you might imagine, uses the heck out of filesys.exe. And, and SQL Server CE is just a bunch of DLLs. So some of those, one or more are marked as such that this DLL is only ever going to work with filesys.exe, and therefore that's, that's just an example of that kind of savings. There's other things, but that's, that's another benefit. So as you can see, 6.1, lots of new memory choice, you know, availability, much more headroom. We've relaxed things, particularly around device exe. So I think we made a huge progress for it, so that alone is a great reason to use 6.1. So let's move to 6.5. 6.5 is just a refinement of all the things we did in 6.1. So no new, no, no nothing here in the slots, all the same slots, but the big change is now in slot 16.61, you can not only put those read-only file DLLs, but you can put module DLLs. And you know, module DLLs are the cool kind, right, that actually do something. So um, that's great. So now when an OEM's building a new device, they no longer say, well, these are file DLLs, and this section here is module. They're just going to say all are module DLLs, and they can all go there. And so that's great. They're all going to live there. Uh, and it simplifies things for an OEM when they're building devices and stuff like that. We have to worry less about, well, our recommendation is to do this. Now they can just mindlessly do that. Um, module DLLs, you know, Doug and I were talking earlier. Doug, you were going to tell me, what, what is the deal with module DLLs? Why are they faster? I, I go out here and say, you know, not only is it great we put them there, but they're faster, too, than file DLLs. What is the deal there? I'm back. Okay, so fundamentally, um, a file-based DLL, file DLL is like any file that on Windows you would load off a storage medium. So it's demand paged in, which means that they actually have to, the operating system has to allocate physical RAM, commit the physical RAM, and then copy the code into that physical RAM. And so, that, so, so when it's, we say a file-based DLL, it's treated like a file. And when the demand paging takes a while because you actually have to do this physical copy, plus you're wasting pages of physical RAM that could be used for good things. So that's the problem with file-based DLLs. Windows CE is unique and much better than certain larger operating systems produced by Microsoft in that we can actually execute code in place. Just kidding. Go right ahead. It's okay, you know. 
We can execute code in place, which means that we can map code when we build the operating system. We can designate certain DLLs as XIP or execute in place. And the module, the, the tool that builds this is called ROM image, actually does the first few steps of loading an XE into memory, even though it doesn't load it into memory, and then maps that as a file that way. And it's considered XIP. So those are the module-based DLLs. And in those cases, you, they literally, the operating system doesn't have to allocate physical RAM. They just map the original page of code into the virtual space directly. So there's two good things about that. First, we're not copying, which is, means we're faster. And second of all, we're not wasting RAM. We're not using RAM in two places. And so we can serve RAM and we're faster. So both things being good. So the ability to have module DLLs other places. The OEMs have always been able to choose which, in, which way to do it, but by forcing them in 6.1 to have to do the file-based DLLs, we were gaining space and losing speed. By being able to put module DLLs up there, you're actually gaining space and gaining speed and saving RAM. Well, I think back with the 6.1 slide where, you know, those two slots were saving you up to 64 meg right there. Um, I, I think the savings is around the same with that. The, yeah, like I showed. Um, no, 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 I apologize. It's, there's no change in the RAM you're saving in 6.5. It's the same as 6.1, except now all those things get the speed he talked about that we didn't have. So you save the, the 64 by making those DLLs, file DLLs in 6.1. So you got to save memory. You got up to 64, but they weren't the fastest DLLs in the world. And then with 6.5, now you can use the faster DLLs in that same area. So new, no net new savings necessarily. Yes. Yes, yes, that is the right way to say it. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, the last thing I want to touch on is this process threshold. So you've heard the whole 32 meg, 32 apps running, that kind of thing. And you know, way back when, some of the earlier devices, Pocket PC, Phone Editions, uh, the OEMs, and the mobile operators went crazy, preloading tons of apps. Uh, and I know people who would, uh, what are the names of some of those pocket, big pocket PC phones? And like on a fresh boot, it's already borderline, you know, on using up all 32 of them. And you try to one, one app. And, and Windows Mobile tries to stay alive and it has this self-defense mechanism. So it starts sending Windows messages to basically tell you to chill out, shut down, you know, hibernate and, and kill you if need be. Uh, so that it doesn't crash by, you know, using too much. Well, that's fine. And so what we did is we had a threshold of 30. When you got to 30, it started shutting things down. But some folks realized that that wasn't good enough because it turns out you could plug something in that could spawn more than a couple of processes at the same time and put you beyond the limit. And then, you know, it's bad time, right? Bad things happen. So we've lowered the threshold to 28 to give you more headroom. So I know some people are going to be bummed out and think it's a, it's a bad news, good news thing. You know, not as many apps are going to run at the same time, but we're going to prevent you from getting too close to that final limit. Um, most devices I see these days, hopefully the, the OEMs have learned a lot over the years, and so I, I don't see them just st stock full of EXEs being preloaded and, and clogging up. So I, I think we're in good shape here. So that that's, takes care of our kind of our high-level view of the slots. Now 6.5, other faster performance things beyond these module DLLs. Some of these will seem really obscure, but all together, they make a difference. So loading JPEGs, that seems like one little thing, but if your application uses JPEGs, images throughout the app, we did a little change. A lot of these JPEGs and the, the hardware that does it was you know, a 128-byte boundary, but we weren't using that same one, and so there was a mismatch. So simple little tweak. We're aligned with the hardware. The JPEGs pop more. So anybody who's using JPEGs in your app, you're feeling the love. Glyph cache. How many people have used like these registry hack tools for Windows Mobile before you downloaded them? No, am I the only one? Okay. Well, anyway, you always get these deals to boost performance of your device by changing all these registry settings, and one of them has always been Glyph cache. Boosting that seemed to make your screens and everything pop and it go a lot faster uh, in the, the device as a whole and your applications. Well, we decided to. It was at 8K. Now we're bumping it to 64. 
uh, 72 for English and 128 for Asian builds, and it's all about font rendering. And so now we have this bigger cache for all these fonts. You will notice it in your apps, in our apps that come in the device, and your apps that you build managed or native in the speed uh, as, as your text is printed. It goes hand in hand with the next thing down, the GDI. GDI is unbelievable to me that we used to just write things out one character at a time on the screen, but we did, and, but now we're not. If you have a big long string that you want to write onto your application, we're just going to go zap, and it's all out there in one shot as opposed to one at a time. So I think seeing the, the GDI change and the glyph cache are going to work hand in hand. So anything with text on your apps, you're going to see a noticeable pr performance improvement. Uh, switching the Today screen, th this is a little more obscure. You may or may not have seen this uh, in the past, but you know, home screens in general or plugins and going from the home screen to other apps and back and forth. Sometimes we would notice in the past the home screen start to degrade in performance or slow down or parts of it turn black or other things like that. Anyway, we took care of that. So hopefully you shouldn't have any of that badness anymore. Paging pools. Anybody ever heard of the paging pool? Okay, it's another thing which some OEMs, a lot of OEMs used it and some didn't. Um, it was, and in some cases, it was something you could hack in the registry, but in many cases, it wasn't. Anyway, paging pool is just like it's like another cache, another preload, you know, uh, memory to have your apps pop, really load a lot faster. Um, if you look in, not that you all can, but in our OEM documentation, there's even guidelines showing how fast, you know, a lot of OEMs if they were using maybe had three meg of of that and uh, showed how much faster things like Outlook and other apps would load, or even the operating system itself, boot time, was all improved in performance uh, going from like three to six meg of the paging pool. Now that being said though, you've got, you need to have a lot of memory on your device because all that works against you if you decide to have a big amount of deal. But you're noticing that the latest round of devices you're seeing, like the Diamond, the Touch Pro, and stuff like that, you're seeing 280 meg of RAM and stuff like that. So it was a variable thing for OEMs in the past. Now we enforce it. This 15 meg, it's way bigger than anybody I've ever seen hack it before. So, and why did we do it? We did it for our new IE, our new IE6 mobile uh, browser. It's a big application and it needs help getting up fast. And so the paging pool cranking up to 15 meg turned out to be the sweet spot to help get it loaded and get your pages loaded faster. And so we enforce that with every 6.5 device. But guess what? All your other apps get to take advantage of what we were doing for IE. So your apps should all launch faster and stuff like that. And then we've upped the minimum device specs to the 400 megahertz, 128 meg RAM, and 256. So there'll be less variability. I think we're already saying no. A lot of devices are already exceeding that now. Um, there was a time in the past where we were using those 200 megahertz OMAP processors and stuff like that. Those were bad days. So let's move along. Yes, yes. So the OEMs know that that's the new floor. And so they can't go. So now we've taken the big, big three, you know, big view of all the slots. Let's move into one slot, into your application process space. Um, and, we, and I'm going to just kind of go from bottom to top. Um, you know, as we saw in that. The tool I showed you there, um, you know, the EXE is at the bottom. It's loading upward, and every thread that it has, it creates a 64K stack, you know, for all your local variables, print with that kind of stuff. And you got the heap, you know, you create your objects and all that kind of stuff around the heap, and you have all that vast land of virtual memory. But wait a second, there's those pesky DLLs that read hate so much, causing that DLL crunch uh, heading downward, and so. All the DLLs from your bad neighbors are pushing down on you as you're trying to go up. And so um, anyway, this is kind of a, you know, a, a standard view of the, you know, from a native perspective. And then there's that cool large memory area, which seems like the breakout point where you know, the nirvana, we want to go there to get more memory. And you can do that. You, know, you can create, you can memory map files into that and treat them like a file. And that's a place, you know, just like you'd be reading and writing to a file on the, the disk even. You can do that up there. Uh, and, and store things out of that out of your slot, which is great. But that being said, someone else can come along with their map view of file call, and uh, if they know where you are at, they can they can see your stuff. Now, I think for the most part, maybe that maybe it doesn't matter. You know, you're building apps. A lot of companies build apps for their users, and they're out there, and 
that they're not worried about rogue other apps finding the memory addresses or things like that. Now, you know, I know this will come back to haunt me, even being so cavalier about that. But uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, that's how you get out of there, mostly is memory map files. So now let's take another look of the same process space, but from a managed perspective, a compact framework perspective. It's kind of the same, exe at the bottom, stacks, but now you have this app domain heap thing uh, where we create structures. You know, everything's based on metadata and IL and stuff like that in the compact framework, so it doesn't have that same realness. And so we create structures in that heap down there. We have a JIT compiler. So, so actually jumping all the way up to the top in the large memory area, what happens when your managed app launches, the CLR takes the IL in your EXEs and DLLs and it memory maps them into the large memory area. And that's where they live. And then as your app starts going along and you go through your call stack, it's pulling that IL down into your slot and JIT, JIT compiling it as it needs it, as it's going through. Uh, and then there's the GC heap, and so as objects are growing and growing there, and that's where they live, and you know about the, JIT, uh, the, the garbage collection kicking off at one meg of garbage. So I, I think everybody, most people get all that who's been doing managed development for a long time. Um, the other little thing is, and I talked about this on this, my blog, one thing you should just take away from the comment I made about the fact that we memory map EXEs and DLLs and just pull down their IL, is that the DLLs really aren't DLLs. It's just a file. It's just a bag of bits. It's all it is. And so it just happens to be running in process with you. But it was, it's convenient to call it a DLL and to keep it separate and everything. The CLR is just putting it up there and pulling down its stuff as it needs to anyway. So the good news about that is since it's not a real DLL, then it's not going, you know, causing damage to all your buddies and all their other slots, right? So your managed DLLs do not have that negative impact that native DLLs do on all the other applications. So something good to think about there. Um, also a little tidbit, and this goes back to what Doug was talking about with the uh, execute in place and where things live. There are things that are part of the operating system behave differently than things that are not, that are installed afterwards. So I talk about in ROM NetCF using 60, 650K less of your slot memory than if you installed like NetCF 3.5, let's say, yourself. The operating system looks at it differently and treats it differently. And so the operating system, when you're loading, you know, this is a real slam, unfortunately. I know we're all trying to go to NetCF 3.5 like a long time ago, like at MEDC 2007. Uh, but if you're memory constrained, it's something to think about. Think about if you need all those features in 3.5 or not. If you don't, then you may want to just stick with the NROM uh, NetCF 2.0. SP2 because it's treated as part of the operating system and so you know 60, 650k may not seem like a lot but for some people who are really pushing the envelope it might be a big deal. So there's one last thing I want to mention here. There's an elephant in the room on this screen and it talks about the image of the EXE. When CE launches your EXE it looks at the size of the EXE and it blocks out that space at the bottom of the slot. Just like you saw on the display here, um, you know, going back to my thing here. All those guys at the very bottom coming up. CE blocks that out mindlessly. Maybe that's, that's cool for native apps because that makes sense. But for managed apps, it has no bearing on reality or anything. The CLR is running your app and it's pulling things from high memory and JIT compiling it. So the takeaway is we just wasted a bunch of space in your slot for you. Um, uh, you know, sorry about that. And we've been doing it for a long time, too. Um, so for those of you who are building really large apps that are maybe 5 meg or 10 meg or larger, and you're running out of memory, well, wow. It's because your 5 meg or 10 meg DLL, when it loads, the operating system just grabs that 10 meg right off the bottom and says, sorry, you can't use that, even though the CLR could care less about that space I allocated for you because it's not even paying attention to it. So that's not so good. But luckily, there's a, there's a solution to get around that. So I call it the mem maker pattern. A guy named Brian Pike at Pepsi figured this out. Uh, I think he noticed some strange behavior 
and started goofing around like any other curious person might and noticed that EXEs were, you know, the operating system was mindlessly t taking out that memory. Um, and so uh, last time I was in Dallas, I was, I, you know, I, I met with uh, Glenn and, and he shared these findings with me and I thought they were really extraordinary. And so, and he sent me a sample app and I spent, a, and I was really excited about it. I was like, this is cool. And we, we could see it work right away. And I was like, we should tell everybody, this is great news. Um, but I kept my mouth shut because I wanted to vet it by our engineers and architects on the kernel team and different things like that. And then after a while, because, you know, some people weren't quite sure what was going on. It's not enough for me to come here and say, start programming like this. It's great. You're going to save memory. Because I know someone in the audience is going to raise their hand and go, well, I want you to tell me how that works or what's going on behind the scenes. So I, we, we, we didn't make it public to, you know, widely until we knew exactly what was going on. And, that, and, and so what I said was what was going on. The operating system was just grabbing that, that space. Uh, and, and it shouldn't be doing that, but it is. And so the key takeaway, so I, I, th I think about MemMaker, I think about QMM386 and, you know, trying to find memory like we always used to do in DOS and find a way to put drivers into high memory and things like that. That's what always made me think of MemMaker. Um, you know, this is just a case where it's a real simple change. It's, there's this way you've always been building the apps. You kind of feel like, well, here are the, here's the rules. Here's how you build it. And, uh, you know, this is, pains me to make a Star Trek reference, but I know a lot of people have seen Star Trek recently in the movie theaters. And so this is really geeky to talk about the Kobayashi Maru. But the key there was you had to change the rules of the test, right? And that's how Kurt got through it, and that's what we're going to do here. Just change the rules of the whole deal. Quit building apps the way you've been doing it because there's a better way, and it's a real simple change. You're going to make a tiny exe that in your main submain, you're immediately going to call out to a DLL, a static class inside a DLL. You're going to start building your whole application in the DLL now and instead of the exe. That's the key takeaway here. So you're going to have this teeny tiny exe that's going to take up almost no room in your slot, and then everything else is going to live up there in the large memory area in your DLL. Now, is it la la land forever and it all stays up there? Well, no. There's not a total free lunch. And, we're st and you, I'm going to be the first to admit, we're still investigating to find other ways to keep things up there and find other places for them. But the key takeaway is it saves you the, the, what you lose right off the bat with the EXE, and everything lives up there, and it gets pulled down as needed as you're going through the call stack and JIT compiled and that kind of thing. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So here's a sample app that Glenn had sent me. Um, and so kind of like you saw on the slide there, if you had a, this kind of represents a standard executable, like you may have built yourself. Uh, real simple app, basically took a, what was it, like a 2.25 meg bitmap, Glenn and just made it a resource file and bound it to the exe. And so when you compile it, the exe is going to be that big, right? So we compiled it, and there's this 2.25 meg exe. You load it, and sure enough, it's taking that space. And so that's how a normal app would run. And so that's in the bottom project here. But then we have the optimized version, where we have an optimized exe and an optimized DLL. And so the key difference here is if we look in the, where we, the entry point on the optimized exe, you see here in the main that I'm immediately calling into my optimized DLL and calling into this thing called startup. You can call it whatever you want. It can be program. But uh, let's, let's see where it's calling into. Wow, it looks a lot like what you just normally had. You, know, it call, you, you create a, cla a static class in your DLL, and then you put a public static void main in the DLL, just like you normally had in your EXE. And then you do application run from there, and you launch your forms, and then use whatever cool pattern du jour of the week that you want to. Um, and go from there. And that is really all there is to it. Um, so um, with that, let me, let me show you that in reality. I'm going to switch over to my HTC Advantage. So there you see the standard EXE is 2.25 meg. And the optimized EXE is 4.5K, but the DLL is 2.25 meg. So if I launch the standard EXE, it's going to come up. And again, this is all code Glenn sent me, for example, code, just because he needed to prove it to me, and then I had to prove it to a bunch of other people. Like, you're crazy. Um, anyway, this little app comes up, and you can. It, it, what it's quickly showing you in the standard EXE is, remember that 32 meg slot? It's telling you, 
Well, I've got 25 meg of virtual available to me. So let's, uh, let me launch the optimized one. So remember how much space that was. So if I launch the optimized DXE, same exact app. Well, now this time we have 27.9 meg, almost 28 meg available instead of the 25. So you can see we just saved some space there and you just bought yourself some extra memory. And let's take a look at that in our cool little virtual memory app. I'm going to hit this thing called Snapshot. Basically, it just does a refresh of all the slots. So we can take a look and see what's happening visually. There we go. All right. So slot 18 is optimized EXE. Where's standard EXE running? There he is. OK, so slot 12. So maybe hard to tell. It's kind of highlighted, but not very well. But uh, if you look at the bottom of slot 12, and you see the, the blue coming up from the bottom. That's the EXE space that CE blocked out for you, um, which is not being used by the CLR. And then if we move over to our optimized version, that's doing exactly the same thing over there. You can. It's almost imperceptible, uh, at least visually. Um, so anyway, kind of a common sense, duh thing. Yes, sir. It's it's if nothing else, it's just about wasted space. At the bottom of that slot, I know you're thinking, oh, it's got to come from somewhere, right? It's actually double. So somewhere up in the high memory area, and I'm going to have Glenn come up here, and he's going to show another app that's going to let us drill in even deeper. It's a system spy app. I guess what I'm saying is, you're right. I know you're thinking, well, Rob, that memory there is probably just somewhere else in La La Land, the high memory, and there's no net change. And that's not true. It's double. It's the CE allocated that space based on the file size. So it says, oh, well, the way I run is I'm going to look at your file in the header as I'm loading the EXE, and I'm going to see how big it is, and I'm going to automatically block out this much space here at the bottom of your slot. And then you're going to go do your thing. And that's appropriate for native apps. But for managed compact framework apps, the compact framework doesn't behave that way. It operates differently, and it's not acting on stuff that's down there at all. So it's you know, up here, these other high slots up here, actually I can't even show it, and Glenn's going to show you here in a second, the system spy application. Um, th there is a difference. There, it, it isn't a zero-sum gain. Y yeah, this, there's hardly anything here, and so you're right, that 2.25 meg is somewhere in, in the large memory area, right? It's, and yes, on this one, it's going to use both. Not by, by RAM. Virtual. The loader sees an exe. It checks the size of the exe and it reserves a region of address space the size of the exe. But then about three lines of code later, it says, oh, look, this is a managed exe. And then it just calls the execution engine. And it never demand pages in that space that it reserved. So it's wasted virtual space. Does that It does. If you need two meg of virtual space, and let me tell you, there's a lot of apps that <laughs> die for two extra meg of virtual space. So as you're looking at it, the takeaway is you're starting at a disadvantage in the standard EXE. You now have this much left, whereas this guy has that much left. So he's right. You're just starting at a disadvantage. And the bigger you EXE, if you had a 10 meg EXE, you'd see this blue line going way up here. And so you're already up against it. You know what I mean? Needlessly. I guess that's the takeaway. Uh, if, Glenn, do you want to come up here? We've got another app that Glenn sent me. And it's, let me get it, fire it up here, find it. Here, you get the microphone and take it from here because you know more about it. It's just another, uh, what is it called, System Spy? Yeah. Basically, after finding. Oh. After finding this project, uh, after finding the uh, VM mapper on uh, Code Project, 
I went and investigated on some more in, in depth to see how they were actually achieving it. What this is is a kind of like task manager for the desktop, but uh, it allows for you to show uh, the processes and what slots they're in. By default, what I did was just show the user processes, and you can actually show all of them. And what it does is it's all all 64 slots. What you see here is the used the RAM being used. There's the bootloader. So how to drill into a process. So let's go to the one we were talking about, the standard EXE. If we view its properties, you'll see here, see that image? That's the image. That's the space that it said it needed in order to load just for the file out of the process space. Then you have the reserved, and that's how much it said it was going to total need to run its heaps and everything, and then committed. That's how much it's actually using. Okay? It shows uh, free of 25. So it hasn't committed anything, but it's used up that much RAM, virtual memory space. It's only actively using 432 of physical. So if you go look at the other one, you notice how they'll get loaded in whatever slots open. Now see this one, the image size is down because the image of the EXE is now not being loaded there, it's being loaded into high memory. And you can see where the, all the other ones get loaded. Well, you can actually see down here in the 38 area where it actually does load. So you can investigate and find out more about, well there's another thing, look group. Quick get. You can see where all the address, each DLL loaded and what address. So like on this device, NetCF loaded here, which meant it was your DLL low watermark is 14 meg. So you have the ability at runtime to figure this out and see if you're going to have enough RAM. Pretty cool tool. I'm going to work with Rob. Need to get get it out to everybody. Yeah, I think it'd be an invaluable tool to have. So you know, like earlier, we we're talking about the other stuff, like uh, like uh, device.exe, things in the operating system. This is such a handy tool. Not only looking at your stuff, but now we can visually realize, like where it's loading the device drivers, and clicking View Properties, and you go, Wow, look at all the stuff that's being loaded by this guy. You can see why we could have run into problems in the past, and, and this list is just getting larger and larger. So that's why it was helpful to give it another slot for those stacks and everything. So yeah, I think this is an invaluable tool for any serious developer on our platform. So cool stuff. So last thing I want to talk about is just some other, you know, not rocket science, but kind of my, you know, I often think of myself as the Forrest Gump of programming and. I just kind of stupid is as stupid does my way through life here. But it seemed to me that, you know, in addition to all these cool things here we got where we're saving memory and going into high memory, we also know that all these slots give us fresh 32 slots of memory. Um, well, not 32 now. You know that you don't get all of it. And so maybe you can combine some of these ideas together uh, to get even more memory for your application. So I, I, here, this first part, I talk about fast cache. So storing, storing data in the one gig area, for, we already talked about memory map files. So native DLLs, how they can, you can just, you know, native applications can memory map. There's actually, I think OpenNetCF has a wrapper um, to let you do that for managed code. So you can read and write a memory map file. So, you know, think about applications we build. You know, we, we start them up, maybe we're pulling a bunch of data from the database. Uh, and maybe we, we have like lookup tables and things that we keep in memory that we can access quickly, look up tables, instead of always pulling from the database, we, we cache lots of stuff. And so that's all going against us. Well, you know, maybe there's another place we could cache it, right? Maybe we could cache it outside of our slot. So maybe using memory map files is a place to cache data. Um, the other thing, and I, was, I built a little sample app, um, you know, in-memory in database, uh, like a hash table, you know, things like that, in another slot. 
So build another managed app, exe, running in slot 74, or not, you know, but anyway, another slot, and it loads up, and maybe all it's doing, maybe it's a, a, a place for a, a cache for you, and you use inter-process communication methods to get at that stuff at really fast rates of speed. So you've probably, if you've you know, been to MEDC or any of these things in the past, you've, you've seen us talk about different IPC methods for apps to talk to each other. You know, obvious one you can think of is sockets. You can just, you know, talk to each other via sockets. There's also another one that's called point-to-point uh, -point message queues, which is another great way uh, you can send stuff back and forth. So put a lot of these Lego blocks together with IPC plus running in another slot. I run up against it. I've got my slot here and the cool things I'm doing. But if I want to, if I've got a device with a lot, of, I mean, now, you know, there's no free lunch. You have to have a device that has a lot of RAM so you can really take advantage of this. But if you do, and we're starting to see them all have a lot of RAM, well then, yeah, build a hash table that's running in another process space with its own fresh 32 meg, and cache all your stuff there. And as you need it, as you're going through your forms, pull it dynamically from there. It's all in memory, and get it that way instead of your own memory space. Obviously, you need to test it, and your mileage will probably vary, but it's something worth trying. And then the other thing I've goofed around with is SQL Server CE. It's a bunch of DLLs, one of our strengths we talk about is it runs in process with your app and so it's faster and all this great stuff but you know what i've got customers who've got really big databases and they've noticed sometimes that sql ce over long periods of time it's a native app and it keeps allocating stuff and guess what it's not always taking stuff giving stuff back to the operating system and so i've i've got customers who got to have one customer every 66 queries it makes, it drops the connection and clears everything out and then builds it back again because the database kept using more and more memory. And so while you get all that fast love from it being a deal on process, you also get all the memory it's using counting against your slot, right? So it's a good news, bad news thing. So we've all spent a lot of time, I joke with Andy, we talk about you know the 100 different data layers we've all created that work differently over the last few years. Well, here's another data layer for you. Build an EXE and take your coolest data layer and wrap it around SQL CE and have it run as a server in its own process. And then use your app, use IPC methods, send, you know, you can imagine a socket deal. I'm going to send my query string, select star from blah, blah, blah. And then it's going to return the answer back to you. You know, maybe it'll return back generics or whatever. Yeah, you got to figure out how to do that. Yes? Why? I don't know why. D Doug, do you know why we did that? It was done originally, I believe. It was done because nobody would ever need more than 32. <laughs> and, <laughs> and at a system that was built in 1990 that you couldn't get a mega of RAM on a machine anyway at a reasonable amount of cost. And you're right, it was all for firmware and EEPROM, you know, little it things. Also, it also made a trivial algorithm that was cross CPU for memory management so that the operating system So how do we have more than that in Windows D6 then? Embedded 6? Mm -hmm. Embedded 6 threw away that model, makes bigger page tables, wastes more memory. It's significantly less efficient uh, on very small memory amounts than 5, but we don't have that environment anymore, so it doesn't much matter. So there's a trade-off in everything. But it was, we've got more RAM now, let's go ahead and utilize it and give everybody a bigger view. Yeah, someone probably said, this is stupid. Let's rewrite the kernel. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, when C first came out, I mean, think about how much memory they were using back then. I don't think anyone ever imagined. If someone could do a great Bill Gates impersonation of they will never use more than 640K memory ever, it's the same kind of thinking, I'm sure. You know, I mean, Bill Gates used to say that we'd all be computing with OS2 in the 90s, right? So you shoot that video one day. Huh? You have to make that video one day. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's my takeaway. So yeah, these are others. You know, try them out. You know, I've been trying them out. You know, there's nothing scientific, but you, you kind of get it now. You see how it all works, and we can have slots talk to each other. So use the DLL stuff. Use everything. When you're building things in other slots, you know, do the, use the MimMaker pattern there, too, and IPC, and see if you get the performance you need. You may find out that you do. Um, you, you, just, you just never know. Heck, what I love about you know SQL CE, yeah, you know, there's a lot of it, a lot of people don't take advantage of the very long connection string that you can create for it. There's a lot of parameters and 
people that use almost none of them. You can change the behavior and get a lot of more, a lot more performance out of SQL CE, you know, like the max buffer size and things like that, and the flush times and things like that. That helps you replicate larger data sets, the tables, more tables to the device. It also means more things are able to happen in memory before it stops and flushes it to disk. Bigger space to do more queries in memory. But when you do that, as a, in normal, all that counts against you. So if you have a one meg or a four meg max buffer size on SQL CE, well, that's counting against your EXE. But if you put in another process space, it won't. Is there going to be a performance set? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. But, but try it out. It might not be that bad. But an in-memory cache like a hash table, it might not even be noticeable at all. So just something to think about, uh, you know, because I know most of us are out there building solutions for our customers. And so, uh, you know, our customers are wanting more and more and pushing the envelope further and further. So, you know, whatever we can do. So that is all I got. Big takeaway, you saw the story, 66165, more and more virtual memory. Uh, this new pattern uh, from Brian Pike or Pepsi, you know, and now everybody knows about it. Pretty simple to implement. You might as well do it. Any questions before I ask you a question? I know we've had a nice interactive deal. Yes, sir. The MemMaker pattern, is that 6, 1 and later? And does that include 7? Works. Well, I'm not going to talk about what you just said, but it works anywhere. Uh, <laughs> the folks at Pepsi you know, are running Windows Mobile 5. Okay. Yeah, so it, it doesn't care. Yes? It doesn't matter as much. Well, if you're doing managed code, it doesn't make any difference because they're all going to be memory maps anyway. If you're doing native code and it's a module DLL, I'm not, I'm not saying be wasteful or stupid, but it, the, the impact isn't there like it used to be. Since we're, we're aligning at 4K boundaries instead of 64? I thought so, yeah. You can double check. I, I, I talked to the other authority, Mike Hall. That's where I get most of my information. He's pretty good. But uh, he's aligning. He's yes, he is. But, uh, he's pretty good. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that's been my takeaway is ever since we went to the ARM processor as of 6, Windows Mobile 6, module DLLs, which now everything we're doing in the module DLL, it's, a, it's aligned to 4K instead of 64K. I'm not saying you can now go make. 500 4K DLLs, and that's a good idea. But, but just make the DLL, the entire module, I think that's a good idea. It's just good for DLL. With no entry point? Or just modules are defined as files with code in them. Okay, so that's these are DLLs. If it is native code, it's a module. If it's managed code, it is tagged as a DLL, but it's then just a data file to the because it's just, you know, it's micros. So they load it into the data file and then generate it. Any other questions? All right, I have a couple questions. I have phones I want to give away, dying to give them away. What do we got here? Two blackjacks. Blackjack twos? Excellent, excellent. So are they GSM phones? Okay, so think about that when you're a winner, if you're a winner, GSM. So AT&T, Timo. All right. And as I mentioned to some of you early on, some of you are disqualified from answering these questions. I'm just going to, all I'm going to do is ask a couple of questions that came from this presentation. Anybody so if, in a blue or green shirt that were leading strikes? Correct. <laughs> right. Right. So yes. Yes. I don't want these devices going to the usual suspects. I'd like some other people to be. So. Uh, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions that were in the deck. So if you paid attention, you should know them. All right. So in 6.5, what is the new process threshold where it's going to start shutting down apps? 20. Yes, 28. That's right. Well done. Good, good on you. Excellent. All right. Second question. How much virtual memory do you save in your slot if you use the NROM version of Compact Framework? Nine meg. No. Yes, yes, sir. Six meg. No. Six meg. no. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> you? Oh, was it six forty KB? You're the closest. Six fifty. Oh, come on. Six 
I'll defer to Rick. What do you want me to do? New question. You want a new question? I'm taking the battery off. <laughs> we'll start taking pieces out. You get it right. Now I got to figure out a question. Let me think of another question. All right. Give me. All right. What are the two new? Um, no, this is too hard. Um, yeah. Well. <laughs> I was thinking something like that. They were. For what did you say? For file DLLs? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, specifically. Yeah, that's exactly right. Hey, thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Hopefully now you see that there's another half to 6.5 and, and development that maybe you haven't heard of before. You know, so it's all good. Have fun tonight. Yep. Yes, evals are good. Phones are good. Thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you.